Okay, it's uh, seven o'clock. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the Board of Selection meeting to order for Tuesday evening, Mar uh, excuse me, April 6th, 2021. This meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access, pursuant to an order issued by the Governor of Massachusetts dated March 12th, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the Town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start in accordance with Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that the chair may inform all other participants of said recording. At this time, if there is anyone who intends to record or take photographs during this meeting, Please identify yourself by raising your hand. Okay, seeing none, uh, I would note for the record that members of the board participating remotely this evening uh, are myself, Mary Power, Joe Fisher, and Bill Ramsey. Uh, the next item of business on our agenda, uh, Bill and Joe, we have uh, potential approval of minutes dated March 16th. Uh, I know we're also, uh, meeting on uh, Thursday if uh, and, and we did also post for that night in the event that uh, uh, that we weren't ready this evening. Um, would you like to vote these tonight or would you like to wait till Thursday? I'd prefer to wait till Thursday. Thank you. You got it. You got it. Okay. Uh, next item of business on the agenda is the discussion and vote regarding the appointment of two permanent police sergeant positions and one provisional police sergeant position. Uh, last week, for those who watched the board, uh, we had the privilege of interviewing uh, six candidates for these positions. Uh, and at this point, I would like to turn it over to Chief of Police David Jones, who I believe has a recommendation for the board's consideration this evening. Welcome, Chief. Good evening, Mary. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I'm extremely proud of all the candidates that put themselves forward for these open sergeant positions. They all represented the police department and the town in a professional and thoughtful manner. Prior to the public interviews held by this board last week, the department held a police chief interview panel for all of the candidates, which consisted of Chief William Quigley from Cohasset, Deputy Chief Carol Bruzek from Norwell, and Chief Mark Thompson from Situate. Deputy Chief Ryan O'Shea, Administrative Lieutenant David Petiti and I were also present, but did not participate in the interview or the scoring process. The position of police sergeant is often referred to as the most important role in the organization. They are the frontline supervisors who directly oversee and support the men and women who dedicate themselves to protecting and serving our community. They are almost always the first supervisor to take command of a critical incident and they must possess the knowledge, self-confidence, and command presence necessary to successfully manage these often chaotic events, especially during their critical initial phases. In making my recommendation, I not only took into account their two interviews, but also the overall work history and job performance demonstrated by the candidates. This was not an easy decision with so many qualified individuals willing to take on the added responsibility and liability of a leadership position. Amongst the candidates before you, three individuals stood out, and I submit the following personnel to you for your consideration for promotion. I recommend that Detective, Detective Philip Tracy be appointed as a full-time permanent police sergeant. Detective Tracy brings over 20 years of professional law enforcement experience and a proven willingness to mentor and assist other officers. The chief's interview panel stated that he delivered an impressive interview and displayed a level of maturity and composure while being able to address issues thoughtfully and concisely. His on-the-job performance has shown him to be a dedicated and seasoned employee who possesses a wealth of knowledge and a strong desire to take on a leadership role. He has proven himself to be skilled in handling critical incidents in his role as a detective and as an investigator with the Metropolitan Law Enforcement Council. I also recommend that Officer Brian Fernandes be appointed as a full-time permanent police sergeant. The Chief's panel found that Officer Fernandes was goal-oriented, had a solid command presence, and was aware of the substantial increases in responsibility that comes with advancement. 
His on-the-job performance is consistent with the panel's findings. He does not shy away from increased responsibilities and seeks out challenging roles within the department, such as field training officer and firearms licensing officer. His confidence and critical thinking skills have allowed him to take control of serious incidents and lends to his promise as a leader. Further, I recommend that Officer James Brady be appointed as a full-time temporary police sergeant. The Chiefs panel described his interview as outstanding as he displayed a high level of confidence and command presence, along with a strong knowledge of current law enforcement and leadership issues. Officer Brady's on-the-job performance mirrors the panel's findings. He has demonstrated himself to be an extremely competent leader and role model. His responsibilities as a field training officer, a firearms instructor, and a member of the Metropolitan Law Enforcement Council SWAT team have positioned himself to be a mentor and a successful supervisor. I would like to thank the board for their thoughtful insights and questions during the interviews held last week and for your careful consideration in tonight's appointments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief. Um, I'll go to uh, the board's liaison to the police department first. Uh, Joe Fisher, any comments with respect to the chief's recommendations? Uh, yes, thank you. So um, first, I was um, just so impressed with each person that we interviewed uh, last time and their skills, their dedication, um, it was just uh, awe-inspiring. And um, it was, this is a tough choice. I, I wish that we had more sergeant opportunities uh, for promotion. Um, you know, I was really taken uh, uh, with Officer uh, Caitlin McGillicuddy's uh, work on mental health issues. Uh, the other officers had, each officer really had such incredible um, commitment, training, and a real caring for our community. Um, this is tough. Um, I've, I've spoken with the chief and um, I support his recommendation. Uh, again, I wish um, we could expand the force so that uh, each of these uh, officers uh, would have the ability to be promoted. Uh, so I, it, it, it really speaks so well of the department that these candidates uh, have, have on their own step forward. Um, um, I'm really humbled by, by their candidacy. Um, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, uh, Bill Ramsey. Yeah, I just kind of, I wanna echo what Joe said. I, I think, you know, in, um, if we had more appointments, we could have appointed every one of these candidates um, to this position. I thought they all did a great job with the interview. I uh, applaud them for stepping forward. Um, I, I, I think the, the future of the department looks very good. Um, with respect to the three candidates that the chief has recommended, you know, and Officer Tracy, Detective Tracy has been a steady hand to the department for many, many years. And I think he'll make an excellent sergeant. Um, detective Fernandez has done wonderful work in the detective department. And I think um, uh, Officer Brady is one of the rising stars of the department. So I concur with the chief's recommendation and um, the future of HPD is looking, is looking very bright. And the officers that were not selected, I would encourage them to continue to uh, pursue this opportunity in the future. Uh, without retreading comments that my colleagues made, uh, I too found this to be a, uh, this is a difficult decision which speaks so highly of the caliber of each of the candidates and the department as a whole. Um, like my colleagues, I would encourage the three candidates not selected this evening uh, to continue to seek opportunities to further enhance your already very strong records. Um, I talked to Chief Jones on Friday um, and asked that he and Deputy Chief O'Shea meet with uh, each of the candidates to share some of the feedback and some of the perspective and to talk about a path forward that, again, further enhances the candidacy of, of all these fine officers. Um, and uh, 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 so with that, I would, uh, I would accept a motion from one of my colleagues. Uh, sure. I believe we, we have two votes. I'll move to appoint Detective Philip Tracy and Officer Brian Fernandez as permanent police sergeants for the town of Hingham. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. 
Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Bill, could you do the next one, please? I make a motion to appoint Officer James Brady as a provisional sergeant for the town of Hingham. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Uh, Sergeant Tracy, Sergeant Fernandes, and Sergeant Brady, uh, our congratulations to the three of you. And again, to, uh, to, our, to the other officers that the board had the pleasure of meeting, uh, we, uh, we look forward to continuing to engage with you as, um, as you continue to advance in the Hingham Police Department as well. Um, Chief Jones, I just um, want to compliment you and uh, Deputy Chief O'Shea on the process that you undertook, not just for these sergeants, but also for the lieutenants. Um, this is a very rigorous process. It, it is a process that includes, uh, there are different facets to it, including um, an interview panel from outside the community. Uh, it, again, met many different facets to this process and um, uh, Chief, you and Deputy Chief handled that all very well. And we know that, uh, uh, that our three new appointments uh, will be attending um, training. Uh, I'm not sure if they call it Sergeant training um, I think it's the week after next. Is that right? It is. It's a two-week school at our Roger Williams Uni University, and it's called uh, First Line Supervisor School. Terrific, terrific. Well, again, um, I think this speaks to the, uh, the, the the focus that you and Deputy Chief O'Shea put on uh, developing the men and women of the police department, and uh, we look forward to more good things to come. So, um, thank you again, and and uh, really a, a well done job on this. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, the next item of business on our agenda is the discussion of proposed traffic improvements at the intersection of Chief Justice Cushing Highway, which is Route 3A and Kilby Street. Um, I think we have a few people that are going to be here. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to turn it over uh, to our town engineer, J.R. Fry. But I do want to just acknowledge for the record that we have uh, Sergeant Kilroy, who is a member of the traffic committee. Uh, I see we have Mr. Daniel Miller Dempsey, also a member of the traffic committee. Uh, I, I apologize if I've missed anybody on the traffic committee. So uh, Sergeant Kilroy, if, if I have done that, maybe you could also point that out. Um, I, I know that we have, um, we have close to 40 people, which is a little unusual for our meetings. So my guess is that there are many of you that are interested in this. So I'll just give you an overview of what's gonna happen here. Um, we're going to ask uh, we're going to ask Town Engineer J.R. Fry to kind of walk through uh, the improvements, and I know he's going to put some things up on the screen, and hopefully everybody can see that. Um, we will invite uh, Sergeant Kilroy and members of the Traffic Committee to comment, and then what will happen is the board will ask questions of of the uh, the board will ask some questions, and then we will open it up to the public for questions and comments. So. Um, we'll make sure we get your. We make sure that we'll we'll get your questions answered. Uh, we want to hear from people. Uh, we are. Uh, we do have this as a potential vote tonight mm -hmm. to actually endorse these improvements. Um, so if if there is consensus among the board that this is ready to move ahead, uh, we are prepared to do that tonight. Uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce uh, the town engineer J.R. Fry and turn the presentation over to him. Thank you very much, Mary. And now I'll just share the screen here so that everyone can see what we're talking about. Um, uh, right now, we are presented with an opportunity uh, where MassDOT is, uh, has determined that this intersection constitutes uh, su a sufficient hazard to warrant immediate action. And uh, they had an engineering consulting firm review the intersection and they uh, arrived at a proposed solution that MassDOT was able to uh, fit into their budget to complete the work uh, this construction season, um, provided everything else, uh, provided there are, are no other issues. Uh, the work is located at the intersection of Kilby Street and Route 3A. Uh, at which at this location is Chief Justice Cushing Highway. So uh, the work primarily constitutes 
uh, the installation of two new traffic islands uh, with sloped granite uh, edging that will uh, allow for a right turn egress from Kilby Street and a right turn uh, ingress to Kilby Street in either direction, but it will no longer allow for typical uh, cross traffic access and it will uh, deny left turn access uh, for all vehicle movements at the intersection. Um, the work will also uh, add sidewalk within the right of way on the west side of Kilby Street, uh, up and around the curve. Uh, it'll provide a new um, re rectangular rapid flash beacon. Uh, so signalized, semi-signalized crosswalk uh, to cross 3A and to provide um, basically an, an additional indicator to oncoming traffic that people are attempting to cross. And uh, that significantly improves pedestrian safety and pedestrian access. Um, we also see this as a benefit for the neighborhood because it will uh, also eliminate a lot of cut through traffic that would utilize Kilby Street to avoid the 228 intersection or the Summer Street intersection um, and would simply cut through uh, between Hingham and Hall. So, you know, we believe that there are a lot of benefits to this, but the primary one is, is one of safety. Um, Sergeant Kilroy can speak uh, more uh, or better on this than I can. Uh, however, I believe there have been uh, several recent significant accidents. Um, this is a safety concern that is not going away. And uh, we believe that it's in the best interest of the town to uh, endorse this and uh, move forward with this project. Um, thank you. JR, could you or could Sergeant Kilroy um, just speak to the role that the traffic committee played in um, kind of interacting with the state and in vetting this proposal? You know, were there were there other alternatives that were considered? What you know, what what sort of caused? You know, I, I know the traffic committee is endorsing this solution. I think it would be helpful for us to maybe hear from um, hear from them. Sure. Would you like to take that, Jeff, or shall I? Sure, I can. I can uh, comment on that. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, so this has obviously uh, been a point of contention for a long time. Um, in 2016, I actually uh, brought this to the traffic committee um, and it was after a, a fatal accident at that intersection. Um, you know, I've been in the traffic division for approximately 15 years now um, and unfortunately had, have responded to numerous crashes at that location. Um, when I took over in April of 19, I uh, revisited it and primarily due to just the amount of crash volume there. Uh, since 2016, I had had over 50 crashes at that location um, and started just resourcing and trying to come up with ideas that were feasible. Uh, in February of 2020, I met with the engineers uh, from MassDOT um, and uh, they had a design company come out, uh, an engineering company as well, come out and meet with us on scene there. Um, and we came up with some, some ideas uh, that would hopefully benefit and mitigate some of the crashes at that location. Um, it's uh, significant, um, you know, issues. There has also been, you know, numerous issues with regards to uh, volume, like as the JR had mentioned, from residents. Um, and I've constantly tried to address their concerns. Uh, the primary uh, complaints were uh, speeding on the cut through uh, trucks. It's a restricted roadway. Uh, so trucks, uh, oversight trucks, commercial vehicles, um, pedestrian property. No, um, I think, uh, Sergeant, so I think Sergeant Kilroy froze. Sergeant Kilroy, I think you froze momentarily. Okay. Am I there now? Okay. You guys are here? Yeah, you're back. 
Um, uh, yeah. Sar Sergeant, in terms of the, or, or, and I'll throw this out to JR as well, because it sounds like the, the connection is still a little balky. Um, in terms of the discussion of the traffic committee and in terms of the issues that, that we're trying to solve, to, to what extent does this design solve those issues? And are there any aspects of this proposed solution um, that, that the committee wishes maybe was, were different? So I think the, the biggest issue that the committee faced is the fact that we have very limited jurisdiction in this intersection. This is a state road that is controlled by the state and they have the authority to determine how traffic is controlled through the intersection. So uh, ultimately, you know, regardless of what best solution um, we might have been able to attain, uh, it was going to have to meet with the approval uh, of the state. And there were a number of different solutions that the state looked at, including uh, installing a low speed rotary, um, as well as an additional signalized intersection. And the challenges with both of those were the impacts that it would have to operations on the rest of 3A, which was a significant one. And in terms of the, the signalization, how it would interact with the two signals that we already have at locations which are more necessary, 228 being another state number route, and Summer Street because of the significantly oblique angle of approach, uh, especially northbound. Um, that, and then in conjunction with um, the state was able to identify money for this project where they wouldn't be able to uh, identify significant funding for a, a much larger project that would, would have re been required for full signalization. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, maybe I'll, uh, we'll start with Bill. Uh, Bill, do you have questions for JR or for Sergeant Kilroy and the traffic committee? I do, Mary. Thank you. I have a couple. I have a couple questions. First of all, Jr. So, what is the? What are the limits of our jurisdiction here? Was, um, uh, is the traffic committee making this recommend recommendation to MassDOT for approval, or is Mass did MassDOT make this recommendation to us? MassDOT made this recommendation to us um, after a review of all of the different options that were available, including a no build option, which is kind of a standard engineering option. And um, the traffic committee, but what MassDOT does is because it's in our community, they reach out to us and they want the community to support this effort. Uh, they don't want it to uh, be, as has happened so often in the past, a state implemented uh, project that results in significant local opposition. And so the traffic committee considered all of the available options. Uh, what are, you know, what the town's availability of funding would be if we really wanted to push it on, on a different solution and, and whether or not uh, it would even be implementable uh, because we lack jurisdiction. And because of the safety issue, the traffic committee believes that it's important to endorse this and demonstrate support for the project to mass stop. So it, it, I guess my question is, JR, so if this board was not to endorse it, would mass, mass stop could still go ahead? I mean, we don't really have any jurisdiction over this road, correct? Uh, they could still go ahead. They could, absolutely. Okay. All right. So that's my first question. So what I heard you say was no cut through, tra uh, the proposal is to eliminate cut through traffic. Yes. Um, 
did you also say that I think it's northbound traffic cannot go left onto Kilby? So that is, uh, so all left turns are eliminated as well as direct direct through traffic. So in other words, um, for a normal traffic movement, left turns off of 3A will not be permitted. In other words, you'd have to go up to 228 to make a left turn and go towards Hall. So, so obviously we have a lot of residents who live on that street are gonna not be able to take a left onto their street. That's so true. Guess, yeah, they, so they won't be able to take a left from that location. There are, obviously there are uh, other routes that you can take to get to your street, whether sure. it is to um, change your approach just a little bit. For example, you could, and it depends on exactly where you're coming from, but, but you can continue up Summer Street to Rockland Street and then take the right off of Rockland Street. Um, you can also come around on the south on 228, uh, if, you're, if you're approaching from the south on 228, and come up to Rockland Street on that end, or yeah. take the left onto 3A from uh, 228, and then take the right onto Kilby. Okay, all right, so uh, thank you. Uh, Sergeant Kilroy, a couple questions for you. Um, did I hear you correctly that there, that there's been 50 accidents at this intersection in 2016? Uh, probably more than that now, sir, um, definitely. I've, I've had, uh, I think, probably three or four in the last two weeks. Uh, just the other day, uh, significant crashes with airbag deployment and injuries. Yeah. Uh, every time I hear the location, you never know if it's going to be uh, not too bad or serious because some people get on the brakes quick enough and most people don't. Yeah, I, 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 I'm aware of that fatal accident that occurred there about a year or two ago. Um, so, Dr. Kerroy, do you know the percentage of accidents that have occurred there? How many have been due to crossing um, 3A onto Kilby, and how many are due to taking the left? Do you know the numbers? So, sir, I don't uh, know exactly offhand um, about the... Um, about the percentage regarding that, um, I do know that I do know that the uh, majority of the crashes occur from people crossing. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the majority of them. I know that my my concern with uh, I brought up to the engineers was, uh, you know, I'm sure Jr. can expand upon it, but uh, you know about the no left turns. But uh, they did bring up valid points, and if I did my my more research regarding the specifics of each crash, I'd probably be proven correct by them. Uh, every time you do have traffic stop there, uh, someone waiting to turn, people's visibilities become obstructed, uh, and that is usually uh, another contributing factor is a, a left hand turn. It's, it's, yeah, I, know, I believe that the fatality was, a, was someone trying to um, negotiate the crossing movement, mm -hmm. which, which, which I think is the most dangerous part, either crossing, um, well, anyway, traversing 3A is extremely dangerous given the, what's the speed, is, is the speed limit 50 on that highway, is that correct? At that section of roadway, sir, it's 45. It's 45. All right. And um, you, obviously, you're familiar with this intersection pretty well, obviously, based on what you said. Did, have you, did you view a lot of traffic passing people on the right when people have been stopped to maneuver left on, on in either direction? Yes. Unfortunately, it, it, there's a very wide berth there, so people yeah. can go flying around each other. So if someone stopped waiting to take a left, um, you know, it's, it's just one more piece of the puzzle, um, that needs to happen because, uh, you know, somebody's trying to cut straight across as someone's making a left, they're whipping around each other and because it's wide enough, it, it's wide enough to get vehicles around. If the, and if the speed limit is 45, did you put the speedometer out? Did you put the trailer out there and get a, an average speed count? Uh, it was, um, uh, I did not put the data out there. Um, we, I mean, the speeds are always roughly that speed yeah. uh, or, or greater. It's very, pretty rude. Okay. All right. I, th I think that's all I have now, but uh, thank you, JR, and thank you, Sergeant Kilroy, for answering those questions. Okay. Yes,
Uh, Joe Fisher, questions? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, <coughs> I'll, I'll ask, uh, first I'll ask a question that I think I know the answer is, is there any cost to the town associated with this project? J. There is no cost to the town associated with this project, no. So, the, so there's no budget item for us, okay. Um, do you see any unintended consequences as a result of making these cha changes? For example, drivers still trying to make a left turn but doing it illegally, uh, you know, taking routes that may also be hazardous. Have you considered or do you anticipate any unintended consequences here? Well, the, there are, of course, always unintended consequences. However, um, people making illegal turn movements uh, is prescriptive, but, you know, we have laws to control that. Um, it doesn't change the fact that, you know, a certain number of the accidents which currently happen there may be due to violation of a law. Um, we cannot control for every action. What we can do is reduce the incidents by uh, making certain movements uh, um, illegal, which then reduces the incentive of people to do them. Now, as for you know, other consequences of this action, I would anticipate a greater volume of traffic, a marginally greater volume of traffic at the Summer Street and, um, and East Street intersections. However, both of those are signalized intersections and they're designed to handle the additional volume of traffic. Got it. Um, with respect to the left-hand turn uh, now no longer being available, were left-hand turns a contributing factor with any pedestrian issues, pedestrians trying to cross there? Has, has that created a problem? I don't know that the left-hand, other than the fact that the, unfortunately, the existing crosswalk is very poorly located. Yep. And it and you'd have to cross through what would be a left turn approach if you're trying to uh, continue north on Kilby Street. The um, in addition to that, the the pedestrian entry into the crosswalk is obstructed from view. The pedestrians can't safely see whether or not they have safe access, and the vehicle that's approaching does not know that there's a pedestrian that has entered the roadway. Um, and, it, and then it's a very, very, very long crossing. It's about 60 feet long, which is incredibly dangerous. You're leaving a pedestrian very exposed. Uh, yeah. This limits our pedestrian uh, crossing to about 28 feet. So I, I note that there are certainly other uh, portions of 3A where left-hand turns are available, Hingham, Cohasset, you know, uh, other locations. Um, and I would expect that drivers would anticipate that they could make a left uh, going in either direction. Um, do you see, you know, the likelihood of dri driver confusion, uh, you know, issues that, that may make, a, make it problematic to ban left-hand turns at this location? Because of the signage and the preventative, the actual construction of the median island, which will physically impede the movement, I do not see, um, I think people, if they're, if they're infrequent travelers in this area, so frequent travelers in this area, they're gonna know right away what I need to do to get to the location I'm trying to go to. Infrequent travelers in the area will, observe the median and the restriction. And what they will do is they will advance to the next turning opportunity, which in both cases is a signalized intersection. Yep. The other, um, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
I'm sorry, sir. Um, the other the other issue too is that um, the when we discussed this with uh, Mass DOT, uh, GPSs will automatically upgrade as well. So if you're following your GPS, it, the, the turn restrictions will be there. It, it won't it won't be a viable route. Yeah. Um, so that'll that'll also help. And in, and if Mass DOT moves forward, what's the timing uh, on the work starting completing? and potential impacts on traffic while the work is underway? So I would imagine that the uh, work would begin uh, early this summer, uh, possibly as early as May. Um, I would imagine that the work itself would take about a month to complete total, restriping, installation of signage, uh, installation of the medians and things like that. And the impacts um, on a short-term basis won't be significantly different than the uh, ultimate finished uh, impact. Um, there will be a couple days where, uh, for example, the north side of the Kilby Street uh, intersection will be closed to traffic while they install the media. On other, there will be another couple of days where the south side of the traffic will be closed to, or the south side of Kilby Street will be closed to traffic while they complete uh, that median work. Yeah. But in large part, um, it should move uh, fairly expeditiously with many, with few additional impacts beyond what we fully anticipate due to the traffic change. Um. And final question, looking at the packet, it appears that uh, neighbors and abutters were notified, is that correct? Yes, we did want to make sure that everyone was aware of what we were proposing. Um, and, and in particular, all of the people that this would have the greatest impact on. Um, now, I know a lot of people are concerned about the negative impacts um, but I do want to emphasize the positive impacts. Uh, quality of life by reducing uh, cut through traffic on Kilby Street, improved safety for pedestrians crossing 3A, and, significant, and most significant is the improved safety for anyone using the 3A and, and Kilby Street routes. Uh, so... I, I normally would follow up to ask if you know what the neighbors said, but I suspect we'll be hearing from them in this uh, meeting. So I will not ask you that and uh, reserve that for later. Great, I really appreciate uh, your your responses. Thank you. Um, uh, th thank you uh, to both of you for answering a lot of the questions. Uh, before I do open this up to the public, I uh, I noted that a few minutes ago, a member of the traffic committee. Uh, Daniel Miller Dempsey had his hand up. I see the hand has gone down. Um, Dan, I didn't know if you wanted to comment as a member of the traffic committee on um, any any parts of the discussion we've had already. Um, but uh, but if if that is the case, I would um, I would invite you to um, make any comments. And if you could please uh, just begin with your name and address for the record. There you are. Yes. You're back. Hi. Thank you. Uh, Dan Miller Dempsey, 88 Kilby Street. So obviously, surprise, I'm on Kilby Street. Um, but um, Sergeant Kilroy actually talked about um, what I had my hand up for. So um, I would, I will say, and I, I can also wait um, to talk about it uh, as a resident if people would, would prefer. Um, do you think that's more appropriate? Um you know what? I think, uh, wh why don't we just have you kind of lead off? So since you're on the committee, okay. you get to be kind of the first citizen so, lead off. And if I could, just uh, if, if you could, just a second, Dan. Um, yeah. Folks, as, as you're offering questions and comments, um, our sort of protocol, just to kind of keep this going, is if you could please direct any questions or comments to me as the chair, I most certainly will be directing all the questions to the experts here who can answer your questions. Um, but that just kind of helps us, uh, you know, keep going, keep going with things. So, uh, Dan, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, in addition to um, obviously the the largest concern being the safety of of people and cars and the amount of accidents, 
Um, we have noticed in our neighborhood with our own children that the way that the crosswalk, and I know JR mentioned this, is set up, it's very, very difficult for them to cross over to um, South Kilby Street. So what our family has been doing is the, the kids cut through the train parking lot and over to summer to cut through, like to say to walk to the library or walk up to the high school. Um, so the addition of a much smaller semi-signalized crosswalk, um, especially if anyone's driven towards the rotary at certain parts of the day, you'll know that there's a, a significant amount of solar glare there as well. Uh, we're going to feel a whole heck of a lot better with our kids sort of being connected to the rest of the town after this work is done. So I just wanted to add that in. And I appreciate um, you letting me speak up. Thank you. And thank you for your um, thank you for your volunteer service on the committee. Um, uh, I see another hand. Um, Tim Dempsey, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm the dog walker in the family. So uh, I'll speak as a pedestrian. Uh, I know the master plan is, talks a lot about how they want to make Hingham a much more walkable city. If you if you could zoom out on this, I know you can, but if you were able to zoom out on this picture, you'd see East Elementary School just north of where the um, picture cuts off uh, across East Street. And so this intersection was really not just Kilby Street, but all of the neighborhoods down by Rockland, uh, Bonnie Briar, all of those streets down there, all would to get to East Elementary School would have to cross here. Uh, because if you can, would continue down, there's no way to get to Summer Street uh, because there's no sidewalk on Rockland Street in between uh, Kilby Street and Summer Street. Uh, and that's uh, Rockland Street's also a, too busy of a street to walk on without a sidewalk. Uh, and also just the crossing, I know there's a crosswalk and a flashing light at the intersection already as it is. Uh, there, it's, you have to sprint across it. I, I cross this intersection on foot daily and Cars absolutely never, ever slow down because they don't see you and aren't aware of you. So, and you uh, imagine what it takes to get me running and you'll know, <laughs> but it's, um, right. as, as a resident of Kilby Street, I very much support this. Great. And Tim, just for the record, if you could also just give your address. I apologize, uh, 88 so, Kilby okay. Street. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, is there anyone else who either has a question or wishes to make a comment? Uh, Peter Dunphy. And um, Michelle is going to unmute people as your hand is up. So uh, I think, uh, Peter, you should be ready to speak. Welcome. Sure. And I'll just say for those who may not be familiar, there's they may not know how to raise their hand in the Zoom thing. So at the bottom, there's a little reaction when you hit raise your hand and it lets Mary know who's raising their hand. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have a question first. So the sure. crosswalk... Peter, your name and address for the oh. record? Peter Dunphy, okay. 108 Kilby Street. Thank you. So it was referenced that the crosswalk is semi-signalized. And I just would ask that you further explain what kind of signal, what that looks like. And then on the plan, I don't see any indication that it is signalized in any way. Chair, can you answer that question for Mr. Dunphy? Yes. So the, um, let's get back to the plan real quick. So the, and, and actually, I'm not. JR, I think they have to, we, we asked for that to be amended. So that may Yeah, we did. So this is an old version of the plan, but basically um, there, there are going to be pedestrian actuated uh, rectangular rapid flash beacons installed at the crosswalk. So what those look like are about uh, two inch wide or two inch high and about 16 inches wide, I wanna say 16 to 24 inches wide, um, flashing yellow lights that when the pedestrian actuates them, uh, they will blink rapidly uh, on and off to uh, notify drivers that some that a pedestrian is waiting to use the crosswalk. And and if okay. and it, it, just so I understand the traffic regulation, if people followed the traffic regulations, would mm -hmm. they should stop? If if people follow the traffic regulations, you are required to stop to allow a pedestrian to cross 
at a uh, marked crosswalk, yes. So I guess I, I just want to um, say two things as a comment then. That answered my question that we sure. totally support making an improvement here and are uh, you know willing to deal with the no left turns because it's a hazard and the crosswalk is a vast improvement over what there is now. Um, and I also, I'll, I'll just say as a comment, appreciate Sergeant Kilroy's advocacy for dealing with this problem, having been at a couple of committee meetings and seen the work he put into it. Um, and, and then we just have a, 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 one other question, I'll just say, which I've heard from others, but about what the flexi posts are in the middle and the sort of, you know, we really want something there, but just how they would look. Basically, Chair, it, looks like can you it looks like a construction site in my mind if a flexi post, but I don't fully know what that means. Yeah, um, we, can, we can we can address that. Yeah, the, the, the flexi post themselves, I don't know if I have an illustration of it, um, but it's basically a uh, vertical plastic uh, non-structural barrier that um, it'll, it would fold down, but what it, does visually is it uh, demarcates the lane and prevents traffic from visually believing that they can make the movement to, to make that left turn. Okay. Uh, Chair, maybe as a, as a follow-up, um, because I do know there are a number of interested people, maybe if there's some kind of an image that, that uh, you could get and if you could um, potentially, uh, you know, I might be able to share it in a moment. Okay. It's also, um, it's also most likely that those uh, delineators were going uh, will be a uh, a temporary uh, installment to um, the situation because we still were concerned about. That's why I think that that drawing is uh, could be slightly dated. Also, um, we we want to make sure that. If in the event that a fire truck or something needs to access that side of Kilby Street, they'll still be able to navigate uh, that area. We checked with fire for that as well. So uh, those are one of those things that uh, were, was a concern so that it could still be accessed in the event of an emergency so that nobody would be uh, um, having an adverse effect on their response time as well. Great. Thank, thank you, Sergeant Kilroy. Uh, Mr. Dunsey, I'm going to go on to a few more hands. If you had any other follow-up questions, you're welcome to raise your hand again. Um, Sean Geary? Hi, thank you. Um, Sean Geary at 128 Kilby Street. Um, so I, I had a couple questions, and, and, and Peter actually touched on them, and I will say that we are also very much in favor of stopping the, the cut through traffic. Uh, every time I cross the intersection, whether on foot or in a car, I feel nervous myself. And, and, it, and you know, we see the accidents there. It's um, it's dangerous. So, uh, and we think that things like the like having the granite curving on the medians is wonderful. The signage I, I think does a good job. Um, and, and really, the the flexi post is my main uh, question at this point because. Uh, you know, I think we can, you know, and I have two questions. One is the flexi post and if there's going to be temporary or can just be potentially amended away because it seems like there will be signage uh, that's very visible as well as curving. And I can't think of an instance along 3A or in town where flexi posts have been used. So this seems to be uh, quite, un uh, quite an unusual solution from my perspective and, and one that, that is, is detrimental to the um, sort of look and feel of this part of town. Um, and so uh, that's more of a comment at this point. Hopefully th those aren't there in the final design. Uh, and then the, um, the second question I had was relative to uh, the ability to do things like have a planter or, or other um, greenery associated with these medians. We see that in other medians around town. It's, it's a nice touch for the neighborhood. It gives it a very nice neighborhood feel. Um, and so I, I want to know what ability there would be for either the town or even potentially the neighborhood um, uh, to, to have that associated with those medians. Um, and, then, and then my third question, I guess I should have said there were three, is uh, will there be any changes to the timing at the light on 228? Um, I anticipate going up um, and then making a left onto 3A and then a right onto Kilby. Um, and so... You, that does back up 
quite significantly. Uh, and so are, have there been any considerations for improving the timing there uh, as this goes forward? Great, thank you. Um, so uh, JR and, and uh, Sergeant Kilroy, maybe we'll start with Mr. Geary's first question, the flexi posts, and you've got the image up. And I, I think the question I'm hearing is, does this need to be a permanent thing or is this maybe temporary until sort of patterns get established? Um, JR, Sergeant Kilroy, can you comment on that? I believe uh, Sergeant Kilroy correctly stated that this was intended to be a temporary situation until the traffic patterns get established. Okay, and then um, Mr. Geary's second question was with respect to the islands, whether there's any opportunity for any sort of greenery and how that, um, how that might be, um, how that could be done if, if it was allowed. Is, is that something, because this is a state road, is actually they're, they're kind of on Kilby Street. Um, is, it, is that something we can answer right now or would we need to follow up? I, I, I think we would have to follow up on that question. Um, okay. It's not completely out of the question that something could be done um, long term. Uh, there's a, a separate issue, but one that we will have to confront with the 3A project itself as to long term maintenance of all of these types of islands. Uh, although I do appreciate that he mentioned that the, the neighbors could take care of it. But um, ultimately, it, it, be, it does become a DPW responsibility. So uh, that is just one additional consideration. Um, with all that said, considering the nature of the uh, traffic in those locations, uh, we can approach the state and find out what our options are there for some yeah. greenery. And, uh Chair, I would just note, and you may not be aware of this, but the Hingham Garden Club actually maintains a number of islands like this around town. Um, the, the one that comes to mind, uh, right, at, right at Cold Corner, you always see members out there. I'm always afraid somebody's gonna, you know, somebody's gonna get injured out there or by the library at, at Levitt Street and East Street. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would say that the Garden Club um, has been very diligent and has had a high degree of ownership and care for the islands they have responsibility for. So that, you know, th that, that may be another option if, um, uh, that may not be another option. And then uh, uh, Mr. Geary's third question had to do with the timing of the traffic light on 228. That's something that will be evaluated once the uh, installation is in place. And if there are additional adjustments that need to be made to the timing, they'll be made at that time. Okay, terrific, thank you. Mr. Geary, thank you for your questions. Um, Tina Bibby, welcome. Tina's muted. Well, um, Ms. Bibby, if you can unmute yourself. I believe you're unmuted now. Uh, Ms. Bibby, we are still having difficulty hearing you. Um, could you, uh, you appear to be unmuted. Could you check the sound on your computer? Um, Ms. Bibby, I'm so sorry. We're still having difficulty hearing you. What I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, I'm going to go on to somebody else, but I will come back to you. Um, I, uh, we see that your microphone is on, so, um, I will, I will come back to you. I might ask if you could check the settings on your, on your computer to see if, um, perhaps your microphone is, is off. Um, uh, Senior Chief Keith German. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, members of the board, um, Keith German, 104 Kilby Street. I rise tonight in full support of this um, traffic amendment. Uh, I'd like to commend actually the traffic committee for specifically and specifically Sergeant Kilroy and our own town engineer and the other members with finally having seen this as one of the greatest safety concerns in Hingham. 
Uh, I've lived on this street all my life. I know me other members have mentioned it already. I myself would never let my children, we had three children here across that street. I find it quite difficult uh, in, my own, in my own right. Uh, I think the town engineer mentioned it's somewhat over 60 feet. By lessening this uh, approach and putting in this new crosswalk, it will uh, greatly reduce that. I think almost by a third or definitely by half, more than half. So I just wanted to make a few points. I wanted to, uh, several points that will accentuate the positive, right? So uh, I know our town engineer uh, mentioned this, but I think it needs, it's worth repeating. Um, rapid flash beacons in a crosswalk, number one. Number two, eliminate the cut through traffic for vehicles. Number three, we'll eliminate large tractor trailers and trucks, which are already over the gross vehicle weight that constantly traverse this street as a cut through. This will greatly increase the safety of our pedestrians and our neighborhood with many, many families and children's at, children at play. Um, and what, what more could you ask for? And I know that um, Selectman um, Fisher mentioned this, right? There's no cost to the town. This is gonna be absorbed by MassDOT. This is a win-win for everybody here. I can say, as I mentioned before, I've lived here my entire life. And I, for one, um, will have to definitely change my driving pattern. I think the rest of the residents, and I know there may be one or two that have been here longer than I on the street, it's something that you have to get used to, right? Like we have to get used to uh, the masks to greatly in in increase our, our, uh, our health for COVID-19 impacts. This is just one of those hurdles. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be difficult at first. Change is difficult. But overall, overall point I wanna make is we're gonna be safer. And again, I strongly support uh, your vote in an affirmative motion on this and the rest of the residents uh, in my neighborhood as I've been a strong advocate for, for this project. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Moynihan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and to the committee, and particularly to Sergeant Kilroy, because he has uh, he has been a true advocate, as others have said. Uh, Sean and Lynn Moynihan, we live at 72 Kilby Street. Uh, very happy to see that this is, is going to be happening. Uh, there's too many accidents, as several folks have said. I just I have two questions. One is, and maybe Sergeant Kilroy could speak to this, one is, as you're coming from, we're at 72, so we're just beyond Rockfall Road. Uh, and our kids use that crosswalk very frequently in the summer. And my anxiety is through the, <laughs> through the roof. Uh, I have to give them their independence, but uh, it, it is quite concerning. The only issue that I would have or concern that I would have is if car, once cars are coming from the rotary, and there's the, the incline there on Route 3. Once cars hit that uh, top of that incline, it's a 45 mile per hour zone. And if they don't, if there is, if there's a green light at Summer Street, they're flying through. Uh, and the crosswalk, right? I know that there's going to be uh, additional lighting, uh, which we certainly appreciate. But, um, you know, if, if the light is green at Summer Street and these cars know that they're not going to have to slow down because somebody's going to be taking a left, uh, that's my concern with that, with that crosswalk. Is there, is there any way that, we, that signage could be put, and maybe, maybe it's already proposed, signage could be put a little further up right after Summer Street that, you know, there is a, there is a crossing coming up. Uh, slow down, you know, anything that would bring attention to uh, to that fact because they're, you're going to be going straight through as opposed, as I said, to taking a left. My second question is, folks will, on Kilby Street will be going down Kilby Street to Rockland Street uh, and taking a right and others coming from 3A will be doing, will be doing the same if they, if they want to cut through Kilby Street over to the other side of Kilby Street and ultimately 228. I would think that that's going to generate a lot of activity uh, at the uh, the corner of Rockland 228 in Jerusalem Road. There's Victoria's Sub Shop right there, which is a great spot. 
there's a uh, Tedeschi, sorry, 7-Eleven there now. Uh, and I just wonder if the during the study that was taken into consideration with regard to uh, regard to that intersection, because there are no there are no lights, there are no traffic lights there. Great, um, thank you, Mr. Moynihan. Um, Sergeant Kilroy, the first question: the signage, the signage on three A as people are coming from the rotary and approaching the crosswalk. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I believe that it, it uh, will be installed as. Uh, in compliance with the MUTCD requirements. And I'm sure the state also has requirements. JR, you could probably correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I'm assuming, I know we have it as municipal uh, advanced warning. So I'm assuming the state uh, has it also on there and I'm sure it may even be on the plan. Uh, do you know, sir? Uh, I'm not seeing it on this plan. Um, regardless, that is a very simple addition that we can make. Um, so whether it is, you know, on the plan or, or not, um, based on the speeds, it's certainly warranted. Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. And, and the second question, um, whether the traffic impact of these modifications, um, particularly, um, along, um, uh, sort of the intersection where Victoria mm -hmm. Victoria's is and, and. So that was not part of what was modeled in terms of where the impacts would be. And the primary reason for that is because the impacts at that intersection are more destination oriented. And so for anyone that was previously cutting through or turning left on Kilby Street to get in, to, get to uh, make a movement towards Hall, they were going that direction anyway. So it, it's not a, um, it shouldn't constitute a change uh, in the traffic pattern um, or a significant change in traffic volume at that location. Okay, okay thank you. Um, I, Mr. Siriani, I see that your hand is up, but before that, I wanna just try to go back to Ms. Bibby. Um, and I know your hand isn't up, but I'm gonna ask you to unmute again and let's see if, um, Let's see if this is working. We have you as unmuted, Ms. Bibby. And Ms. Bibby, I'm so sorry, but we are still having trouble hearing you. And I'm not sure what the issue is, but um, if, if you would like, I would be happy to give you a call tomorrow morning. Um, if, if there's a question that you have or a comment that you'd like to make, I'm I'm so sorry that we're not able to hear you this evening. I'm, I'm not sure there's anything on our end uh, that, that, we can, um, that we can do. If um, the only other thing I can think of while this is going on is if you wanted to send a quick email to me at powerm at hingham-ma.gov, either with a question or comment, I'd be glad to retrieve my email. I, Mary, I know that's a little clunky. Mary, she could also call in. There's a dial-in number. Yeah, okay. Um, Ms. Bibby, if you also to wanted to call in, um, that might be an option as well. The call in number is 929. Whoop. I'm, I'm, yeah. The, um, the call in number is 929 205 6099. And then just as you did when you logged onto the computer, if you put in the meeting ID, which is 451-213-735, if, if you um, disconnect on the computer, call in by phone, uh, we, might, we might be able to, to have better luck here. So while you're doing that, um, Mr. Siriani, uh, question or comment? Hi, good evening, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good, uh, Joe Siriani, 120 Kilby Street. And I have been trying to mute Tina Bibby for the past 36 <laughs> years. I wish I knew how you did it. No, it's not fair because she's not on the line right now. <laughs> my sister-in-law, and it's very fair. <laughs> okay, I'm, it's family. I'm, we're staying out of that. <laughs> okay. So my comments are these. Um, I very much appreciate the sidewalk crossing upgrade. I think that's very necessary. I also like the idea of the flashing lights signaling for people trying to cross. Also a tremendous idea. 
The thing that I find hard uh, as a resident of that street, longtime resident, not quite as long as Keith German, but um, getting across, crossing over. Now, from anyone coming from the south, you're going to go down to Route 3A and at that set of lights. Well, that set of lights sets up with a right-hand turn to go uh, east on uh, 3A, heading towards Cohasset, or straight. There isn't a left turn area on that particular set of lights. And so now everyone that would normally be crossing through will wind up going to that lights to take the left in order to come down and take the right onto Kilby Street. And I think you're gonna create somewhat of a bottleneck or something back at that intersection. And I don't know, Jeff, if that's something, or JR, that's something that they looked at or looked into or decided that they need to widen out that intersection in order to put in a left turn lane in order to get to Kilby Street or not. Um, so I just brought up the intersection in question mm -hmm. and um, I'm not sure. So there's a restriction towards the bottom here at the, this would be a width restriction right. uh, due to the presence of the Weir River Bridge. Um, coming up on the approach, there are portions of this right of way that it appears we might be able to slide in an additional left turn lane in the future. That's um, pretty tight. It is, it's a little bit tight. Uh, so, but that, you know, if some, if a more significant change needed to be made, um, in the future, that would be, I think that their first step would be to retiming that signal to allow for more left turn access. The second step might be to change to a left turn lane with a straight or right, uh, through, uh, so you could either, the right lane would become either straight or right turn. And then uh, ultimately, you know, in an out, out situation, you might reconfigure this intersection more significantly. I appreciate that. I, I think you do create somewhat of a bottleneck there. Um, I do have one other comment. So back, mm -hmm. at, sure. the, back at the intersection of Kilby Street, from my understanding, many decades ago, there was a functional light at that location. Um, I think that would be a much, from my perspective, would be a much better uh, thing to have is a, another set of lights that, that could work in conjunction with the lights at Summer Street at the lights and with the lights at 228. And I know that in South Hingham, uh, along the Derby Street corridor, there's at least a half a dozen lights that seem to all work very well together. And I realize, of course, it would be a money issue. And so um, my question is, what, what would the type of cost for that be? And why is that out of the question, if it is out of the question? Yeah. JR, could you answer that? Sure. So um, the first question that comes to my mind is, what was the reason for removing the light in the first place? Yep. And th that from my perspective, that would be the first question I would want answered. And so I'd be going back and doing some research as to why that that would have happened. Um, as to the, uh, basically it, what it really comes down to, I believe, is uh, control of traffic flow and uh, there's de there's definitely a um, preference for moving traffic through on 3A. I suspect that that might have actually been one of the reasons that um, that they removed the light in the first place is that it contributed to additional delays in 3A, and so that would have been why they removed it at that time. We do have most likely better signal control possibilities now. Right. And we, and based on the analysis that the engineer did, um, you would get fairly similar, uh, you'd get all the safety improvements with 
not significantly dissimilar delay times if you put in a new signal, but where, where it really comes down to at this point is uh, the time and the cost of designing and programming, um, programming in the state TIP sense. In other words, it becomes programmed funding. And those kinds of projects uh, where you're approaching something on the order of a half million dollars get programmed out uh, five or more years at a time. And because of the significance and prevalence of accidents that are currently occurring, uh, we want this to happen now so that we can prevent um, additional incidents at that intersection. My Thank central you. law just happened to come into my house. <laughs> And it's now oh, over great. my neck. So, so, so you can. She, I think she'd like to comment. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, Miss Bibby, um, you know we've been doing this remote thing for like a year. We've been doing this Zoom, and I got to say that this is a first. And, <laughs> and you know, you get props from the board and the town for for someone who really wants to be heard at a meeting. So, listen, we we apologize for the technical trouble, but. <laughs> We're so glad you've come up with a solution I and you're did. even masked up. So you're modeling great behavior. So um, welcome. <laughs> okay, thank you. A lot of my questions have been answered. Um, I, I support any change whatsoever down there. But then that brings us to the other side of Kilby Street. And um, we need a, a medium put there too because it's a cut, like you said, they come flying up and you can't see down that area. But then that brings us up to, like, if we're leaving Kilby Street or using it more, it brings us to the boulevard and Muzzy's Corner or whatever you want to call it. Just as many accidents there, look it up. But I know the state had plans to maybe change the rotary and maybe do a road diet on Summer Street. And I want to know if that was considered in this if, and because sure. that really changed the traffic up when they did try it out a couple, was it last summer? Yeah. Two summers ago? Yep. Was yeah. that um, in this process? Ms. Baby, before, um, before I have uh, Town Engineer Chair, before I answer your question, could you just give your address for the record? Oh, 122 Kilby Street. Thank you. Years. Thank you. And um, Chair, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask if you can answer Ms. Bibby's question, but I also want to remind us that because of our agenda, we've posted this intersection. So we have to be careful that we don't get into a, a, a bigger discussion about other traffic right. opportunities. But I, I JR, if that. you could if you could just put this into sure. context and explain how this fits with the plan for 3A, which is coming up at town meeting, the road diet, and kind of how all this stuff fits together. Right, so the, the state is still uh, in our design for 3A and up into Summer Street, there's, we. There will be a uh, change from a roundabout to a rotary, and up, going up Summer Street, there will be a road diet that continues up to the Martins Lane Summer Street intersection. And the what this will not do um, is, or what rather, one of the, the fears that a lot of people had was that this would end up pushing a lot of traffic uh, up 3A and put additional traffic onto other side streets, including Kilby Street. Uh, now they won't have that option. They'll have to bypass. Um, they'll have to go, if, if they do decide to uh, change their traffic pattern, they'll be going up to Summer Street or up to 228. Um, with that said, uh, based on the modeling, um, we don't believe that the road diet is going to significantly displace traffic because ultimately it still would be the quickest way to get to where most people are going, which is to the beach. So, um, for the most part, we do not anticipate that the road diet would impact kill this, this work at Kilby Street. Um, and in fact, we think it 
to the extent that there would have been diverted traffic, this protects Kilby Street from being affected by it. Okay. Great. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Great. Wanted to know if it was considered. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, one of the benefits that I would just say of um, both uh, Sergeant Kilroy and Jay are, are very involved in all these different projects along 3A because there are a lot of interdependencies. So as we're working on these different pieces, we have points of continuity to make sure that a change in one part doesn't have any adverse impact on some of the others. There's there's a, actually a lot of really good stuff happening along this corridor and um, uh, that, that we hope will address um, some of the many safety concerns that, that many of you have spoken about. Um, is there anyone else who wishes to make a comment or ask a question? Um, seeing none, Bill or Joe, I would be prepared to um, accept a motion if one of you wanted to offer it. Sure. Um, I, I think this discussion has been exceptionally helpful and I think there is a compelling reason to move forward uh, without delay. Uh, so with that, um, I would move that the board endorse the traffic improvements at the intersection of Chief Justice Cushing Highway Route 3A and Kilby Street as proposed by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation and presented in the Niche Engineering Plan Short-Term Improvement Concept Plan dated February 6, 2020. And before there's a second, um, I just note that the plan that we've seen, I've, we, what we've heard is not all of the features are displayed. So I'm assuming it's the, uh, that concept plan uh, as updated. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Second. Uh, Bill, is, great. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Uh, JR and Sergeant Kilroy and, and uh, uh, Dan and other members of the traffic committee, um, thank you so much. It's, it's very clear, uh, especially Sergeant Kilroy, just what we've heard from um, a lot of our fellow residents that you've really put a lot of time and effort into this. And you've been just a really good messenger and an advocate for addressing what has been a really problematic part of town. And, you know, getting, getting the state's attention to put some of our state tax dollars into Hingham, um, it's, it's not always easy to do. And um, so Sergeant Kilroy and JR, members of the traffic committee, um, thank you all so much to the residents. We appreciate your coming out tonight. We appreciate your input on this. Um, we've noted a couple of things about the flexi posts, about the greenery, um, and, and some of these other pieces. So, uh, you know, we will also stay on top of these, but uh, we, will, we will look forward potentially over the next couple of months in seeing some uh, long overdue improvements to, uh, to this corridor of town. So we thank everybody for, uh, for being with us tonight. Uh, the next item of business on our agenda is to sign a contract with Gov Connection Inc for data storage and support. And we are joined this evening by our town director of information technology, Steve Becker, and uh, by our chief procurement office, by our, our uh, uh, procurement officer, Kathy Riley. Uh, Tom or Michelle, am I, are we handing this over to Steve or to Kathy? Yep, I would ask uh, maybe Steve can walk us through the contract. Great, great. Steve, welcome. Sure, thank you. Uh, appreciate the time. Uh, so this is about our uh, data ba backup appliance, and uh, we've currently on, outgrown the existing one that we have, and the uh, support contract is coming due in May. Um, and because we've outgrown it, I've been looking at alternatives uh, to see if we can uh, not only provide what we need, uh, for storage, but, you know, we anticipate some growth in that over the years. Um, the FY20 costs uh, for the current appliance was $21,415. Um, and the alternatives that I've looked at is because I've been uh, extremely happy with the current device that we use, um, I've, I've looked at an upgraded model from that vendor and an additional vendor that has a really strong following with uh, my other IT peers in, in you know, the state and local towns. 
uh, the device from the new vendor, um, because we're not on a support contract, it would we would not only have to pay support costs, but would have to purchase the appliance. Uh, so the support costs on that are a little bit higher. Um, the device would cost over the three year period uh, approximately $25,000. Uh, and it still is almost half the amount of storage uh, on the current on the device that I'm looking at with the current vendor. Um, so that device, because uh, we are a current customer, uh, they update every four years, they update our hardware at no charge. Uh, so then there's no capital involved there and we just have to pay the ongoing support uh, for a minimum of three years. So we have to commit to three years. Um, the, uh, the, the device would be on ITC 47 contract. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, typically a very beneficial uh, cost to the towns that the uh, state negotiates with the uh, different vendors. Uh, so between, um, you know, comparing it with the alternative vendor, uh, I think it's uh, definitely the best value. Uh, it has, like I said, the the features, we're already using a device by that vendor and it's worked out really well uh, over the last, uh, I believe it's four years that we've had that device. Um, so I, you know, I just recommend it as is the best value and it's on the state contract. So uh, it, t it takes a lot of the questions, uh, you know, uh, off whether it's a, a good purchase or not, good value. And uh, Steve, is this part, is this um, funded in the capital plan? Uh, we don't have to pay capital because we're already a, a vendor. Uh, we already use this vendor. Uh, so they, they refresh the hardware device at no charge. Uh, okay. Because, because we've been with them for four years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Joe, Joe, questions for Steve? Steve. Um, Okay, Steve, thank you. Um, where is the device located physically in town? Uh, the device is located at uh, Town Hall. So we have the, uh, we back up the disk on, on that device, and plus it's replicated up to the cloud uh, from this particular vendor. So that, that was actually my next question in terms of- And that's of... included in that cost. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're satisfied uh, that any security risks are, have been addressed? Yes. Um, and what is the useful life of, uh, of, of, of going this way? Are we, are we going to be obsoleted in two years, three years, or? No, uh, this new device uh, has triple the storage of what we have right now. Uh, the device that I looked at, the alternative vendor, uh, was approximately um, uh, about 50% higher than what we use now. And... Um, the device from the same vendor is triple the storage for less of a uh, cost. Um, I suspect this is not an issue, but what about um, like energy usages? Any energy use associated with this device? Is it high energy intensive? Uh, um, it's it's actually a two use server, uh, very low. It's okay. you know it's a, a very minimal uh, uh, energy costs. Yeah. And then finally, what what is does the future hold for us in terms of transitioning from this device to the next one, three or five years from now? Uh, are we in a good place that uh, we won't be held hostage to technology that we can transition out as needed? Yes, uh, you can definitely, if needed, you could transfer it to another vendor. Uh, you know, if uh, uh, another vendor came out with, you know, increased uh, number of features, Right. Uh, and it made more sense to go that way. Yeah, there wouldn't be any uh, issue going that direction. Great. Thank. I really appreciate your efforts here. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Joe. Bill? Uh, Steve, could you explain again why the three-year commitment? Uh, one for cost, but and what they what they do is they they obviously they you know when they provide a, a device at no cost, they want to lock you in for a certain amount of time to. Right. Uh, basically take it, you know, take advantage of it. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Bill, I just assumed they were amortizing some costs over the three years. Yeah, I, I, I thought the same thing, but I wanted yeah. to clarify. 
so, you know, a few weeks ago, I remember hearing something that, you know, about the number of emails that our town administrator and assistant town administrator get and have to wonder <laughs> if maybe this is, this is, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway. That's part uh, of it. It all has to be backed I, up. <laughs> you know, you know, um, boy, that the, yeah, the transactional volume, it's something. Um, is there anyone, a uh, member of the public who either has a question or wishes to make a comment before the board uh, votes to take action on this contract? Uh, seeing none, I'd make a motion to sign the contract with GovConnection, Inc. for data storage and support in an amount not to exceed $68,882. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Great. Uh, Steve, Kathy, thank you so much, and thanks for being with us tonight. All right. Thank you all very much for your time. Appreciate it. Uh, next item of business on the agenda. Oops. Um, uh, uh, I, I see a hand up about, I, if it's about this agenda item, um, Ms. J. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm so sorry. Um, by the time I connect, was able to connect to the meeting, I had missed the first portion of the agenda. And when I go back and to view the full transcript, I'm unable to read it. I'm, I'm only able to read it up until the point that I joined. And uh, my question is, uh, would you just, uh, if you don't mind, say the two names of the sergeants who were voted? Oh, selected? certainly. And um, Ms. J, if you could please, if you could just give your, um, your name and address for the record. Sure. Um, my name is MJ, and I'm, I am a former Hingham resident. Welcome. And, and your address, please? I live in Cohasset. Yeah, and your address, please. On L we, we need your address Street. for the record. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, earlier this evening, uh, the board voted to appoint Philip Tracy and Brian Fernandes as permanent police sergeants for the town of Hingham. And the board also voted to appoint James Brady as a provisional police sergeant for the town of Hingham. That's most unfortunate. Thank you for your question. Good evening. Our next uh, topic of agenda, our uh, next uh, item on the agenda is Inside Town Finances, Volume 12. And um, we're going to talk for a couple minutes about Hingham's long-term liabilities. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please, Michelle. Hingham has really two uh, long-term liabilities. One is contributory retirement. And the other is other post-employment benefits, or we also call that OPEB. Um, contributory retirement is a pension allowance. Um, all permanent employees are eligible. Uh, I'll go into some eligibility requirements, but I would note that um, any teachers or school administrators who are part of the Massachusetts Teachers Retirement System, so they do not receive their pension through the town of Hingham, that's through the state. Um, other post-employment benefits, uh, the town, uh, that is 50% of health care benefits for retired and eligible employees who are uh, enrolled in a town-sponsored plan. And uh, when an employee is eligible to retire from the town of Hingham, they have the option of continuing their health care benefits or they have the option of, of enrolling for health care. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please, Michelle. So here's how the contributory retirement system works. Uh, basically, um, municipal employees do not pay, in Massachusetts, municipal employees do not pay into Social Security. That's across the state. And so in lieu of that, there is a mandatory employee contribution that gets deducted from every paycheck. Um, it's, about, it's about 9% with an additional 2% that's withheld for salaries in excess of $30,000. Um, and at the same time, the employer, the town of Hingham, also makes a contribution. The employee contributions are put into an individual annuity savings fund that earns annual interest. And that is done um, through the Pension Reserve Investment Board, which is also called PRIM. And uh, what PRIM also does is they invest the employer contributions. And important to note that all administrative expenses get paid from the town's contribution, not the individual contributions. So what happens? When an employee vests, 
And the vesting criteria are um, if you are age 55 or older and you have at least 10 years of creditable service from Hingham and another and or another community, or at any age with at least 20 years of creditable service, your employ your post your contributory retirements vest. Now you don't have to exercise uh, once they're vested, but once they're invested, you're entitled to receive the benefits. When somebody retires from the town of Hingham, they receive a retirement allowance. And that is typically, it's approximately, uh, it maxes out at about 80% of the average consecutive regular compensation for either three or five years, depending on when somebody started working for the town. And that doesn't include things like overtime or unused sick pay. And the retirement allowance, it's actually based upon the age in which somebody retires, the number of years of service, um, their group classification. So for example, are they a police officer? Are they in an administrative function? And then the average of their highest consecutive years of regular compensation. So important to note that with contributory retirement, the employee pays a portion, but the town of Hingham actually um, uh, the town of Hingham's contribution is substantially greater. If you could go to the next slide, Michelle. In terms of um, Hingham's pension liability, whoop, you wanna try to advance that again? There we go. So um, right now uh, we have, as of the end of last fiscal year, we have $132 million in pension assets. And again, those are invested by PRIM and those continue to earn a return. Our unfunded liability as of the, la the end of the last fiscal year is just under $49 million. So 73% of our pension obligation is funded. Now we have a funding schedule and right now we are on track to have fully funded our pension liability by 2035. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal because what it means is that we are making sure that we are honoring the commitment we made when employees came to work for the town of Hingham. And that's something that, that we believe is a moral obligation. Um, people have been making plans, making career choices based on having this pension be there when they need it. And we think that that's an important obligation that we have. Um, for this upcoming year, I believe in the operating uh, budget, we're contributing about $5 million um, in contributory retirement. Um, so Michelle, if you could go to the next slide. The other liability is OPEB other post-employment benefits. This is retiree health care. Um, up until about 10 or 15 years, 10 years ago, we would pretty much pay this as we went. So if we look at our group insurance uh, budget in the operating budget, a portion of that is paying for active employee health care and a portion for retiree health care. And you know what, what a lot of what a lot of municipalities and a lot of governments realized several years ago, is that if you look at the rate of growth in healthcare costs, it was very clear that unless some of this liability started to be pre-funded, it was gonna take up a bigger and bigger percentage of the budget. Um, about 10 years ago, I heard a statistic that if Hingham didn't pre-fund this, that within something like 10 or 15 years, group insurance would be 25% of our operating budget. And you know, right now it's less than 10. So um, in 2008, the town established an OPEB trust fund. And in addition to paying as we went, we started setting aside additional money that again is being invested by PRIM to fund the future retiree health care costs. Again, we do this because we have, we have a moral obligation to our employees to provide for this. And we also don't wanna overburden future generations. Uh, Michelle, if you could go to the next slide. So we just started um, with our OPEB trust fund uh, about 13 years ago, and uh, Hingham was actually one of the first municipalities in Massachusetts to regularly contribute to the OPEB trust fund in a meaningful way. Um, the first year it was set up, we contributed a couple hundred thousand dollars, and in every year after, we've contributed in the neighborhood of a million dollars a year. Um, our OPEB trust fund right now has $17 million of assets, now this unfunded liability is larger because we just started funding it. It's about $63 million. We have a 30 year funding schedule. And each year as part of the operating budget, 
we need to budget for this. This is a liability that now um, the Government Accounting Standards Board is requiring municipalities to report on their financial statements because, because there are a lot of um, state and local governments that have big liabilities. Um, the state of Illinois is one that comes to mind. They have something like a $2 billion liability for this. And this is actually something that now is factored into uh, things like bond ratings and credit decisions because it's a big liability, it's a future liability. And um, <laughs> the good news is that Hingham has been very diligent. As, as, as we go forward as a town, I know we're gonna be having some decisions to make in future years with respect to you know capital projects and operating budgets. Um, OPEB and pension, we just gotta keep funding them. It's a commitment we made to employees um, if we kick the can down the road, it is only going to end up costing more. Um, we lose the ability to earn return to an earn investment returns that minimize the liability. So uh, anyway, that's that's a little bit about Hingham's two liabilities, pension and OPEB. Uh, Bill or Joe, I don't know if either of you have any questions. I have no questions. That was very thorough. No questions, Mary. Thank you. Great. Uh, next item of business is the COVID-19 update, Tom. I had to unmute myself. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so the COVID-19 update for today, um, April 6th, is uh, as of yesterday, uh, confirmed COVID-19 cases in Massachusetts totaled 607,967. Uh, According to the public health data from the Mass uh, DPH released last week, the town's designated uh, designation remains at a yellow, um, a yellow indicator, indicating a, a medium risk of spread in the community. There have been 82 new cases of COVID-19 in Hingham over the past 14 days, and a total of 1,785 cases in Hingham since the start of the pandemic. Uh, the number of new cases has plateaued in recent weeks. The average daily incidence rate for the town of Hingham was 24.4 per 100,000 residents, and our percent positivity rate was 2.74% for the previous 14 days. Regarding a vaccine rollout, according to the DPH's uh, daily COVID-19 vaccine report, over 1.49 million people in Massachusetts have been fully vaccinated as of yesterday. As of April 1st, approximately 23% of Hingham residents have been fully vaccinated. That's up from 19.2% last week. As of yesterday, April 5th, residents aged 55 and over and residents with one certain medical condition became eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine in Massachusetts. The Baker Polito administration has adopted the CD. Uh, CDC's updated list of medical conditions. And I'll read that list now. Just, I, I think it's important. We've re often referred to these certain medical conditions without listing them. It's important that people hear these uh, so that they know who in fact is now qualified as of yesterday. So uh, the full list of, uh, of conditions includes cancer, chronic kidney disease, chronic lung diseases, including COPD, asthma, interstitial lung disease, cystic fibrosis, and pulmonary hypertension, dementia or other neurological, neurological conditions, diabetes type one or type two, Down syndrome, heart conditions such as heart failure, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathies or hypertension, HIV infection, immunocompromised state, i.e. a weakened immune system, liver disease, overweight or obesity, pregnancy, sickle cell disease, smoking as a current or former smoker, solid organ or blood stem cell transplant, stroke or cerebrovascular disease, which affects uh, blood flow to the brain and substance use disorders. The last phase of the vaccine rollout plan will begin on Monday, April 19th, when the general public ages 16 and over become eligible for the vaccine in Massachusetts. So uh, to learn more about nearby uh, vaccination sites and pre-registration, by uh, please visit the vaxfinder, v-a-x-finder.org. 
mass.gov. So vaxfinder.mass.gov. Regarding reopening, I just wanted to make a quick statement that we will be, uh, the administration, Michelle and I, will be meeting with department heads on Thursday, so in two days, to start discussing municipal reopening plans and we'll report out to the board uh, next Tuesday. Um, Tom, uh, you didn't mention it as part of the COVID-19 update, but you did give the board an update earlier today with respect to some vaccination opportunities for Hingham teachers. I just wondered if you could add that to your report this evening. Great. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Uh, we wrote written the report prior to that uh, coming back. So the town of Marshfield, uh, Michael Moresco, the town ma manager in, ma in Marshfield, reached out to me late last week and offered upwards of 100 vaccinations through their mass vaccination site for Hingham school teachers. So I immediately called Dr. Austin, who uh, thanked me for the opportunity. Um, and he we sent we sent out the opportunity to sign up for that for those vaccinations um and we've received i believe upwards of 30 or 40 uh, additional teachers were able to get vaccinated because of um because of uh um, marshfield's um you know reaching out to us so really feeling good about that they didn't need the full 100 but um we hear from dr austin that sounds like things are, are good over there so uh, that's very very encouraging thank you for bringing that up Mary. thank you uh, Joe, any questions for Tom uh, with respect to the COVID-19 update? Yes. Um, do you know if this, the state or perhaps the town uh, are taking efforts uh, to assist seniors who perhaps might be homebound, can't travel to get a vaccine, to get the vaccines uh, to them and at their, at their places of residence? Yes, this is also true. Thank you again for asking this question. You guys are prompting us beautifully. Um, so we had our command call earlier today, and uh, and the um, we just found out that we we will be receiving. We'll be going to collect them here in the near future. Uh, upwards of ten um, Johnson and Johnson shots or vaccinations that we'll be able to administer to homebound uh, residents in Hingham. Michelle, do you, do you know the date? Do you remember the date that Chief Murphy and Susan thought that we would be doing that? I think they're looking at next week. Next week sometime. So we, we have a list of uh, homebound residents that, that would like to have that, and we'll be reaching out to them to coordinate times and, and the like. And so if, if there are folks who are homebound that would like to get on the list, uh, how do they do that to get on your list? Michelle, do you know offhand? I think the best way would be to contact our senior center team and we can make sure to coordinate with the health department yeah. um, to work on those lists. Right. Great. Thank you. Uh, Bill, any questions? Uh, no questions, Mary. Thank you. Um, anyone in the public, a question or comment with respect to the COVID-19 update? Okay. Uh, seeing none, uh, public comment on items not on the agenda this evening. Um, I recognize Mr. Doble. Uh, could you please give your name and address for the record? We'd ask if you could please direct your questions or comments to the chair. Um, Mr. Doble, I'm going to need to just unmute you here. Uh, there we go. Well, Mr. Doble, you're not quite on. Uh, there you are. I think you should be unmuted now. Thank you. All right. Thank you for letting me speak. Uh, Chairperson and members of the committee, um, 14 Village Lane, Hingham, Mass. And I just wanted to join and, um, you know, get an update on the field studies or figure out how I could get an update on where that stands. I, I was going through past agendas and I noticed that the rec, I think, was consolidating. And through their, um, you know, chair or director, they were going to have the fees flow through them. And, you know, I work actively with the basketball in town, as well as the baseball, um, you know, coaching youth sports and everything. And so just very interested in where that stands and figured sure. I'd uh, dial in and see if I can get an update because I hadn't seen it on the agenda and uh, really interested in see how, you know, the improvements can be implemented uh, as we move forward. Yep. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Doble, I'm going to give you a little bit of information and then uh, I'm going to also direct you on the town website, you can actually get yeah. a copy of the Weston and Sampson report yep. uh, that was produced and that was reviewed publicly. So uh, there is actually a warrant article, I, I, excuse me, um, as part of the budget for, for the fiscal year 22 that will, be, that will be voted on at town meeting on May 8th, 
Um, one of the items that the Board of Selectmen has inserted into the budget is funding to implement the, um, the maintenance recommendations with respect to the Weston and Sampson study, as well as to centralize the, um, uh, the uh, scheduling of the fields. And so what you may, and, and again, um, the, the report uh, is on the website, but essentially what Weston and Sampson said is to start, they said, you need to put a maintenance plan in place. You need to take, you need to increase the maintenance on what you have. And they recommended doing that before we start, for example, adding any additional fields. So they said, step one, introduce your maintenance plan. So uh, actually as part of the budget, we've asked for an additional $241,000 to implement that plan. It has been put together jointly with um, the Recreation Commission, the Country Club, Public Works and the School Department. And as part of that as well, uh, there will be centralized scheduling. So um, those, are, those are some highlights. What I might ask is um, our Assistant Town Administrator, Michelle Monsegor, who's on this call, um, if you wanted to send her an email, it's, it's Monsegor M, M-O-N-S-E-G-U-R-M, at hingame-ma.gov. Um, she would be happy to send you, um, Michelle, maybe the information that was presented as part of the budget hearing. Um, we can't get into a real in-depth conversation tonight because it's not posted, Mr. Doble, but we'll get you the information. And if you have follow-up questions, we're happy to answer them. Um, but we need you to come to town meeting on May 8th and support the budget because um, that budget is going to help provide the funding to really start this very important work. So um, we thank you for being here tonight and, and for asking the question and, and let us give a plug to town meeting. Um, Sean Galvin? Uh, yes, Sean Galvin here at 143 Fort Hill Street um, in Hingham. I understand the town meeting was approved last week for May 8th with rain dates of May 15th and 16th with the election May 22nd. I have a couple of questions regarding the signing and adopting of the 2021 town meeting warrant that should have been on tonight's agenda, but got revised and ended up being deleted from tonight's agenda. Um, when is that going to be signed yeah. off? And the next item is what will be done as far as quorum reductions go? Yeah, Sean, thank you for the question. So first of all, um, we are still in the process of finalizing the warrant this week. And so we, um, we will actually next Tuesday at our meeting, we expect to have the board sign the warrant. We just usually like to wait until, until the warrant is all gathered together. And uh, Sharon Perfetti, um, uh, who works in the Selectman's office is just doing a wonderful job pulling all that together. Um, Tom or Michelle, could you please uh, answer Sean's question with respect to a possible vote by the board to modify the quorum requirement? Yes. Um, so, so that is required to be noticed seven days in advance. We placed an ad in the paper this week and we will put that before the board next Tuesday night as well. Okay, so Sean, we'll be taking both of those things up next Tuesday. And we are scheduled to meet at seven o'clock. So thank you for the questions. Mary? Yes, Joe. Just one point of clarification. I'm not sure that the rain date that was read for, uh, if, if it was for town meeting was accurate because it, it was not the next day. The next day was Mother's Day. So it was, it's right. a different rain date than what, than what Sean may have indicated. Uh, yes, yeah, so the rain date is the 15th and the 16th of May. Those are, those are our rain okay. dates. Yep. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, Selectman and Town Administrator reports. Michelle. Yes, we, we each have one for you tonight. So a couple grant announcements. The first one is that Fire Chief Steve Murphy reported that the Massachusetts Department of Fire Service has awarded Hingham a health and safety grant of about $14,762. Um, we're gonna use these funds to purchase additional fitness equipment for our fire stations. Um, to help combat cardiac disease, which is still the number one leading cause of death among firefighters nationwide. And we wanted to thank Deputy Lou Lachance for writing that grant application. 
And the second one is coming from Tom. Okay. <laughs> Tom, sele uh, anything to report? I think you may have one thing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we thought we'd split it up, that's all. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so today the Mass DOT announced awards for the latest round of the Shared Winter Streets and Spaces program. So thanks to the work of our engineer, J.R. Fry, who we all heard tonight and does a wonderful job, uh, and the Traffic Committee, and that's uh, Sergeant Kilroy and others, uh, Hingham has received $150,837 to add flashing safety beacons to four existing pedestrian crossings, providing safe routes uh, to several schools in Wapatuck State Park. So just fantastic work uh, on all of their parts. JR, thank you. Thank you. And congratulations. Great. Um, Tom, anything else to report? Uh, that's it. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Uh, Joe, anything to report? Nothing this evening. Thank you. Bill? Um, just one thing. Um, last weekend was the um, filming of the reenactment of the Battle of Grape Island. And um, it's going to be coming out in a couple weeks. It was a uh, great event. Uh, a lot of people to thank, but I see Keith is still on the call, so I want to specifically thank him as he kind of um, ran point and coordinated a lot of different moving parts and did a great job. So looking forward to the final production. It should be out in a couple of weeks. Great. Um, and I have uh, one thing to report. Uh, last week, I had the um, privilege of participating in a um, civics event that was sponsored by Hingham High School, specifically the grade eight history teachers. Um, and uh, teacher Jennifer Driscoll was one of the uh, coordinators of the event. Um, myself and uh, JR was there, uh, some town staff, members of the school committee, school administration. Uh, we had a chance to engage with some of our eighth grade students who are working on a variety of civics projects. And uh, they are, as, as part of their curriculum, they're researching an issue, they're trying to find out how they can make a difference. Um, and uh, they have chosen issues that are um, very relevant. Um, one of the groups actually is looking at traffic in Hingham, uh, which is extremely, I mean, it, you know, that's, that's what we spent the bulk of this meeting talking about. Uh, there was another class that is looking at ways to um, manage litter in the town. And that's something that we've been talking about in board meetings. Uh, another class is uh, looking at the food pantry and looking at how Hingham can support our fellow citizens who, um, who are experiencing hardship and who are experiencing hunger. And um, I, I just wanna thank um, the Hingham Middle School and, and the history department uh, but mostly, I would just like to thank the eighth graders that I had the privilege of, of talking with, um, informed, engaged, um, researching a project, um, really just, um, just a, a fine example of, of um, you know, one of the things that makes our school system as strong as it is. Um, I think we can all use reminders that we really do have an outstanding school system and the, the young men and women that I met with were a testament to that. Uh, so with that, I think that concludes Tom or Michelle. We don't have any other votes, do we? Okay. Um, I think with that, I would accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary, aye. Thanks, everybody. Good night and Thank see you. you next week.